Did you know that health is the most important key to your happiness? Outside of perhaps a relationship with God, research shows that health is the absolute most important key to your happiness. Sickness is perhaps the greatest stress you can ever face in your life. Sickness is horrible. It's tough. If you're told by a doctor you have a disease or a sickness, it puts tremendous stress on one's life and on one's family. And I think that we all know that managed health care is one of our nation's greatest challenges today. You knew that, didn't you? Yes. Well, there was this hospital director who was a strict advocate of managed health care. So he would tell every new patient, after three days in the hospital, you're out. No discussion, no exceptions, no sob stories. Surprisingly, he died suddenly one day and appeared at the gates of heaven and was met by an angel. The angel promptly escorted him to a waiting area where he was asked to wait in order to see if he was going to be approved to enter heaven. The longer he waited, the more anxious he became. Eventually, the angel of the Lord finally came back to the waiting room and had the man's file in his hand. And sternly, the angel said, well, I guess we can admit you. Well, greatly relieved, the director said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was a bit worried. People have accused me of being a bit rigid and sensitive and uncaring, but in spite of that, you've showed grace, 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 and you've let me into heaven. Yes, said the angel, but only for three days. No discussion, no exceptions, and no sob stories. I thought that was funny anyway. Wow, health care. It's about that way, though, isn't it? And I think many of us have felt like as we journeyed with Debbie's father's health situation and many in our close relational circle of friends, uh, it can be tough. And I felt like some hospital directors might need that. But anyway, health care is a tough issue in our nation right now. And aren't you glad we have a great physician who watches over us? We have a great physician who watches over us. Let's read the scripture. So Moses, beginning with verse uh, 22. I'm going to have you read verse uh, 26 with me. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out of the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, Read this with me together. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. For I am the Lord who heals you. One more time. For I am the Lord who heals you. Father, make it easy to speak your word and declare it today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. There are 30 accounts of divine healing talked about in the Old Testament. There are 38 accounts of divine healing talked about in the New Testament. One-fifth of the Gospels focus on Jesus' healing ministry. The word healing means to save, mend, restore, cure, and cleanse. And there's two kinds of healing. Healing of an illness, which is a, re a recovery, and healing which keeps us from illness, which is wellness. And God gives us healing grace and power to overcome sickness and disease. Aren't you glad for that? He gives your body the innate ability to fight sickness and disease. I am really glad for that, aren't you? Thank God for the immune system. God put that there. And so God gives healing and grace and power for us to overcome sickness and disease. He also gives us laws, watch this, he gives us laws to live by 
that keep us healthy if we obey those laws. That's why he says in Psalm 41, 4, Heal me, O Lord, because I have sinned against you. That's why he says in Psalm 103, verse, verse uh, 6 and 7, who, and actually verse 3 as well, who forgiveth all thine iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. Jehovah, he said, executeth righteous acts and judgments for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his doings unto the children of Israel. And we just read about that. That's why he says in Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from destructions. That's why he says in Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's why he says in Proverbs 3, verses 7 and 8, he says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. That's why it says in Proverbs 17, verse 22, a merry heart does you good. It really does good, like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. That's why Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, 5, when he foresaw the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, by his stripes, we are healed. Can we give him praise today that he is a healing God who cares about us? Let's give him praise. So the question becomes, how does healing come to us? How does healing come to us? How does healing show up in your life and in my life when it's needed? The first principle I want you to understand in these verses that we read is healing comes in our circumstances. Did you know that? Healing comes in our circumstances. Take a look or another peek at verses 23 through 25. And they went three days, three days. You got, you hold on to that. I'm going to come back to that. Three days into the wilderness and found no water. They come to this place called Mara, and they're very thirsty. And can you just imagine they lay eyes on the water, and mm, that looks wonderful. And they take a drink, and it is bitter. These people, their circumstances, these people are simply walking their from their deliverance, which happened three days earlier, only three days into their journey, and a problem arises. Three days earlier, they had been dancing on the shores of the Red Sea, declaring, our God is deliverer. Miriam had broke out the tambourine, and you think dancing with the stars is amazing. Miriam recorded in the Word of God as she took that tambourine and began to dance, and they wrote songs, and two million people began to praise the Lord because God had marvelously divided the waters. They walked across on dry land, and their God had become their deliverer. It's an amazing thing. Three days earlier, they had this incredible experience God showed up in a mighty way. I mean, Pharaoh's army is bearing down on their backside, and they had nowhere to go, nowhere to go, and God shows up and delivers them. Aren't you glad that he delivers us? So they're traveling across this desert for three days. Can you imagine going three days without water? Three days in the water, and they find themselves thirsty. Their circumstances dictate the fact that they need something to happen. They need the healer. And you know that's the way life is sometimes. You've ever had that happen? I mean, things are really rolling along good. I mean, your business is flourishing. Your family seems so healthy. Things are really going well. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, while you're taking this journey called life, and you're moving along, and you're really excited about the good things that are going on, and all of a sudden, wham, something shows up out of nowhere in the middle of your circumstances, and you go, whoa, this could be a problem. Don't look at me like that. I know you've done it. It's true. It's happened in my life many times where I really thought things were going good, then all of a sudden, through circumstances, through just circumstances, through just living life, something so catches us off guard, and sometimes it's a big deal because it almost blows us away. Other times, it's just a series of little things and circumstances that begin to happen. It becomes the perfect storm, and you don't know how in the world you're ever going to work your way out of it. That's real life, isn't it? And such is the case with the children of Israel. They've experienced this mighty deliverance. We're free. We're going to trust this great God. I mean, he's going to take care of us. He's promised Moses that he would show us his glory. And away they go. 
And they come to a three, the end of three days and they find themselves absolutely thirsty. And let me tell you, the only way to deal with it is to face the circumstances. You can't run from it. You can't stick your head in the sand and act like it doesn't exist. You have to face the circumstances. And let me tell you, God wants to heal the circumstances. These two million plus people are thirsty and they come up this, on this water thinking it lasts water, as we've already said. Mara, by the way, the scripture tells us, means bitter. This place was called Mara. That ought to tell you something, right? And God speaks in this difficult time and he says, I'm the Lord who heals you. And wow, sometimes the first part of us in this circumstance, sometimes the first part of us in this circumstance, we have to look at the fact that sometimes we create it. Sometimes we are the problem. And many times we're the biggest contributors to our own illness and we refuse to face the circumstances. Uh, I'm just going to throw a few things out here. And I don't want to, this isn't about being, being political. I just think that there are issues that do need to look at. I mean, we could talk about environmental pollution, couldn't we? Is that an issue? I don't think that one party owns that issue. They shouldn't. We all should be con concerned about the environment that we're supposed to steward. Well, it's real quiet in here right now. Environmental issues. I mean, the tragic story of the bitter water of Flint, Michigan, my home state, somebody either didn't care or fell asleep. Somebody didn't care enough to cry out, we got a problem. They stuck their head in the sand. And now they got major problems. Environmental issues should be something that we're concerned about, right? At least on some level. And so we can be, we can be our own worst enemy when it comes to some things. Numbers 5.33 clearly says, do not pollute the land where you live. There are circumstances at times that we refuse to face, such as eating right. And I don't want us to feel guilty over this because I battle like you do. All you have to do is take a look. Too much lost margaritas, but moving right along. We pollute our bodies, do we not? And frankly, I've honestly, I'm, I can honestly say that and I'm working at doing better at that. And Brother Mark, I feel better. I really do. It's amazing how just doing a few things right, I haven't heard that Mike Watkins was trying it. I mean, that's a miracle too. People are working at it. Eating right, we pollute our bodies with chemicals and contamin contaminants in our foods, and, 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 then, and then we refuse to face the circumstances. We can talk about social environmental pollution when we find ourselves being in dysfunctional sets of circumstances in our homes, schools, jobs, nation, environment, relationships. It clearly affects us. If you don't think we're in the middle of dysfunction in our nation right now, you, you got another thought of coming. There is dysfunction all around us. Things like war and terrorism and poverty and oppressive governments and abusive marriages and out-of-control drug cultures, all these things promote disease and unhealthiness and pain instead of wellness and wholeness. Circumstances we refuse to face. Here's another one, emotional pollution. Healing sometimes requires us to change our circumstances. I mean, when you have a drug addict, and we've, we've had folks who fell into that, that problem in our own church family, we love them, we embrace them, we try to help them, but sometimes you don't leave them in their same set of circumstances. You have, to, you have to get them outside of here and get them somewhere where they can heal. Am I right? You have to change their circumstances. You have to, if they're ever going to recover. People with healthy conditions might even move to a different location because of better, better health issues, finding a better health issue because of allergies or whatever it may be. People have to do that sometimes. Are you in a toxic circumstance in your life where you need God to heal you or to move you or to do something different in you or to help you make some other choices? If so, we need to do what the Lord challenges us to do so that we can live long and healthy and be God carriers and move to the next generation and let them know that God is our healer. Let's give him praise for that. That's good stuff. Amen. Amen. We can't drink the bitter water of sin the bitter water of negativism and unhealthy diets and high stress and be whole and well. And then we get in trouble and we want to find somebody that's got faith. What were we thinking that led us to the situation in the first place? Pentecostals are the worst at it. We want to get bailed out basically. 
Just give me a miracle. Woo! I'll testify. And never do one thing to partner with God to help us hinder getting in that position in the first place. Is Pastor okay? Am I okay? Boy, I think I'm okay with some of you, not others. It, it really is a serious issue. So we have to figure out how we can partner with God. And that's why we have to secondly fix the problem. There will come times in life where you and I will have to make tough decisions. And many times that decision will mean that the only way the circumstances will change will be when we partner with God and decide that we're going to fix the problem so that we can enter into a place of wellness and wholeness. Can you say praise the Lord? Secondly, we need to understand that healing comes with conditions. There are two conditions for discovering Jehovah Rapha, your healer here. And by the way, that's the language, that's the, that's the Hebrew title that's given to him, Jehovah Rapha, our what? Healer. First of all, you have to lean on Jehovah Rapha. Healing comes in different ways. Did you know that? Who would think that laying a tree on the water would be the solution? These people needed healing and they needed water for their healing. The problem was the water wasn't good. And unbeknown to these two million people in that, that day, they were only three days into a 40-year journey. And it will be for them 40 years between their exodus from Egypt and their entrance into the promised land. 40 years. Everybody go, ugh. 40 years. You're really feeling bad because you've had to wait a week. Moving right along. And during its entire journey, God will be revealing himself through, the, through his attributes. Just as three days earlier, God had already revealed himself as deliverer. Deliverer. When your back's up against the Red Sea, if you're standing there with those two million people and Pharaoh's army is bearing down and you don't have a weapon one and you don't have a prayer, you're going to need a deliverer to show up or you're about to be slaughtered. And God reveals himself to his people. I will be your deliverer. And he rolls back the Red Sea and they walk across on dry ground. And we discover there that God shows them he is deliverer. But now, three days later into this 40-year journey, God is about to show himself to have another attribute. Aren't you glad that God has attributes? Glory is the total sum of his attributes. They've seen him as deliverer. Now they're about to see him as healer. Are you tracking with me? As healer, Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Might I add, this is the first time our Lord is revealed as healer in Scripture. Previously revealed as Man's creator in Genesis, the first part of Genesis, right? We know him as creator earlier and provider in Genesis, a reconciler to Adam and Eve, a guide to Abraham, and we could go on and on and on and name other things, but this is the first time he is revealed as healer. And it's on this 40-day journey, and it's on this journey they discover a different attribute of God all along the 40 years. It would be a fun thing for you to read all through that journey and discover that God shows himself as deliverer, as healer, as provider, as warrior, as miracle worker, as teacher, as their banner, as their guide. He is everything, and he becomes all in all to them day by day for the next 40-year period. And here's the deal. God will show up in the middle of your circumstance and if you need him to be provider he'll be provider if you need him to deliver you he'll deliver you if you need him to be your savior he'll save you if you need him to be your healer he'll heal you he is a great God who carries all power and he can do just that we got to give him praise for that don't we and he does it he does it our conditions and our circumstances will determine his method of healing. You know, that's one of our problems. We get, we get the methods all worked out in our minds. And I think sometimes God just would like to show us he'd like to do it different sometimes. We got our way of doing it, don't we? We got our anointed way. 
come to the altar. I'm not making fun. It's biblical. It's one way, though. There's a lot of healings that didn't require someone coming to the altar and getting oil on their head, even though the Scripture says that's one way. Am, am I okay? And God shows himself to be healer in many ways in Scripture. Please hear this. All through Scripture, we have prophetic pictures of the cross. All through Scripture, we have prophetic pictures of the cross. The first was the crossing of the Red Sea. They crossed from one life, they crossed over into a, another life. It's not just God is del deliverance is found on the cross, isn't it? So we see a picture of the cross during the crossing of the Red Sea. And let me just tell you, all of his attributes are wrapped up in what Jesus did on the cross. When you look at him on the cross, you will find him as deliverer. You will find that he bore stripes on his back and blood's running down his back because he's healer. You will find that he is peacemaker as he's suspended between God the Father and, and, and you and I. As he's suspended there in the air, he connects us and reconciles us. So he's our reconciler. He's our peacemaker. He's our provider. He's our savior. He's everything that we need on the cross. And we get the, a prophetic picture of the cross with the crossing of the Red Sea. But the second is three days earlier. There's a tree there. And there's bitter water. And God says to Moses, take that tree and throw it on top of that bitter water. Are you getting this? That tree, I would advocate, is another prophetic picture of the power of the cross and how the cross, when it's laid over your bitterness, when it's laid over your hurting heart, when it's laid over the fact that you've been done wrong over and over and over again, when it's laid over your abuse, when it's laid over all of your failures and you've got, you're residing with bitterness inside of you, let me just tell you the power of the cross can set you free from the bitterness in your life. And he can take the bitter and make it sweet. And he can take the spoil and turn it around where you're no longer the same person because of the power of the cross. Let's give him praise for that. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We see throughout the Old Testament these true happenings and realities which provide predictive prophetic pictures of the cross. You have to get this. The cross will set you free. I'm not talking about kind of. I'm not trying to be dramatic. Some of you are sitting here saying, Pastor, you're passionate about this. Do you understand what the cross will do for you? Do you understand what that suspended Jesus has really done for you and what he has the power to do in your life right now? If you can't get passionate about that, you won't get passionate about anything. And I'm not talking about any particular emotional response. I'm just telling you, it is life-changing stuff. It'll affect your business. It'll affect your family. It'll affect your marriage. It'll affect your friendships. It'll affect the way you live life in this community, the way you do life. It'll affect everything about you. That's the power of the cross because he'll heal bitter waters. It's a powerful thing. The children of Israel had much to be bitter about, didn't they? Do you think they had anything to be bitter about? Slavery? Abuse? Women and children ripped from their home. Firstborns slaughtered at times. Would you be bitter working out in the hot sun 16, 18 hours a day making brick while Pharaoh sits up there in his ivory tower? Do you think these two million people had anything to be bitter about? But isn't it interesting Right on the heels of their deliverance before they see God in any other way, God wants to deal with their bitterness. Can I tell you that God wanted to deal with your bitterness early in your journey? Because bitterness will keep you from walking into your promised land. Bitterness will keep you from coming into the fulfillment of your promised land. And here's the deal. God has promised lands for all of us, and ultimately we're going to meet at the one big promised land called heaven. But he's got more good things for you and I. 
And bitterness will hinder you and keep you from entering into those blessings, into that promised land that God had. Is Pastor making any sense today? The children of Israel had much to be bitter about. Hear me, bitterness will keep you from entering into your promised land. Bitterness keeps you connected to something from the past. While joy keeps you looking into the future because something deep inside tells you when you've got joy, something good is about to happen. Joy is opposite from bitterness. Bitterness keeps you looking back. Hope keeps you looking forward because something on the inside said, it's going to get better. Allow me to say it this way. Joy says, I'm contented in the present because the Lord is good. Hope says, I've got a bright future. But bitterness says, I'm hurting in the present because of wrongdoings in the past. You see, joy and hope keep you looking into the future. Bitterness keeps you looking back into the past. And the only way you can deal with the bitterness which comes from your past is to lay it on an old rugged cross and get Jesus down over the top of that thing and let him clear up your waters and take those muddy waters and make them clear to where sweet springs begin to well up inside of you and you live your life differently. We can give him praise for that, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bitterness will blind your future. Bitterness will remove the good memories from the past. Bitterness will destroy relationships. Bitterness only looks back. And bitterness will destroy your health if it goes unchecked. It'll create insecurities in people like you've never dreamed is possible. And here's the problem. Some people even have a hard time recognizing their own insecurities, let alone what it's attached to. And many times it's attached to a root of bitterness that God wants to help us with. Is pastor making any sense today? Bitterness. And isn't it interesting that the solution for bitterness comes from Jehovah Rapha, our healer? Secondly, we have to listen to instructions. In other words, learn to obey. Not one amen. I find it interesting. I was reading an article the other day. How It was talking about how many see God's law, the Ten Commandments, being given with God. The article advocated that God is scowling down at the performers, waiting for them to mess up with one of the, one of the ten laws, as if daring them to try something funny or be a little rebellious to see what he'll do if we disobey one. That was the picture being painted. But as believers, we understand that God's law was and is the very foundation of celebration and rejoicing. Here again, the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He took all of us out of the land of Egypt because we had a crossing too. Out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above, that is in earth or beneath, or in water under the earth, and you will not bow down before them or serve them. For I am the Lord your God, and I am jealous you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, we're not talk, he's not talking about little cultural South uh, American, uh, South uh, Eastern uh, American culture words, things that I got my mouth washed out for. I'm going to talk to my mother about that when I get to heaven. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about taking the Lord's name in vain, speaking on behalf of the Lord, and he's no more involved with what you're advocating than anything. I can move right along, though. That's another sermon. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Uh, I'm not unpacking what he says about all of these, but look at number uh, uh, five. Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother that your days... Well, what? May be long upon the land which the Lord has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, on and on and on. 
Listen to me. It's amazing how the Ten Commandments have been flipped to become a negative thing in our culture. As if we're not people of law, we better be people of law or you won't dare walk out in the streets today. A nation and culture that honors fathers and mothers, watch this, a nation that honors fathers and mothers, prohibits murder, condemns coveting, stealing, adultery, false witness, and sets aside a day for worship, and rest is a culture at peace with itself. Operates on trust. Listen, God wants us to have a good land. God wants us to be at peace. He wants our families to be strong. He wants you to be, have rest so that you can live longer. He wants it. Am I making any sense? The Ten Commandments aren't evil. They're wonderful. They're meant to set you free. They're meant to set this nation free. They're meant to be a good thing that when we abide by them and live by them and practice them, that good things happen all around us. Let's give the Lord praise for the law that we need to learn to obey. The church has been silent on this thing. They want to yank him out of here and yank him out of there and yank him out of here and make it a political issue and yada, yada, yada. I'm so tired of that. Yeah, and we'll all go to hell in a handbasket. It's not the plaque that's so important, but let the word of God reside in our heart. They can take down plaques and they can take down signs and they can take this down and that down and advocate this and that. But let the word of God reign in your heart where we become the walking Ten Commandments in our lives where we can change things and be life changers. Amen. Finally, healing comes through confidence in God. For I am the Lord who heals you. It's important to know that we want to be, if we want to be well and whole, that we have to partner with God. And I think it's good to understand when we look at all of this that we are imperfect. Healing comes from God. We can treat people and assist people, but God is our healer. You say, but the doctor healed me. I'm not giving God any credit for that. Well, you can think that if you want to, but the doctor wouldn't even have the knowledge if it hadn't been for God. Mankind wouldn't even have its, its, its instruments of creation if it wasn't for this great creator. The only reason you have the ability to create anything is because God put in you the ability to create something. You sure can't create anything like him. We talked about the human, just the human heart. Mankind, man has never been able to get a human heart like the kind of human heart God made. He, as creator, will transcend any creations we come up with, but he did put in us in the innate ability to create things. So every good thing goes back to God. <sighs> it's true. So we can put the tree in the water, but only God can heal. In this passage, it's the first time that the Lord reveals himself in Scripture and to his people as Jehovah Rapha who heals. And it's, it's in the form of a covenant. I am the God who not only saves you, as he said earlier, but I am the God who heals you, who makes you whole who makes you well. That's why as believers we have such a wonderful future and hope even when we pass on through this life and nobody wants to think about that because God put a great desire in us to live long but when we pass on we have great hope because we are going to be ultimately healed and have a body like we can't imagine and the Lord is going to be good to us with all of that. Can you give him praise that we have a bright future and that we are imperfect now but we have a bright future. What a day that's going to be. We are imperfect but we're also in need, and that's why we need Jesus in the message of the cross. Won't you allow him to heal your bitterness? How thirsty do you have to get before you put that cross over that bitterness? How bad does it have to get? Some of you are saying, well, I don't have that much experience in life. I mean, we always see bitterness when we when it comes up in the way we talk about someone or the way we tell a story or the way we express anger or pain, many times it's rooted to bitterness. But Jesus is calling every one of us to lay that tree over the top of that water. And out of that will come sweet water It'll change your life. That's what he's done. That's what he did on the cross. The scripture talks about how he took the bitter cup. He took the bitter cup so that we didn't have to exist with bitterness. He took the cup at the cross. 
They put the guile and the vinegar in his mouth. He took all the bitterness on himself. That you and I could walk in healing and wellness and sweetness. That's what Jesus has done for us. And so here we are. Do you walk out of here and just keep on trucking along? Keep on doing business? Go home and turn on the game after a good meal? Or can we take a moment and stop before we get caught up with all the business of the day and say, Lord, if there be any bitterness in me, perhaps it's against the pastor, somebody in ministry leadership that hurts you in the past. I don't know how else to say that, but can I take that on today? Can I ask you to forgive us? Jesus said, Father, forgive them as he was suspended on that tree for they don't know what they're doing. Father, don't hold it against them. They don't know what they're doing to me. They don't even understand who I am. Let them have a pass on this one. Do you understand? And for you to get free from your bitterness, you got to let it go too. And you have to say, Father, forgive them. They had no idea. Maybe they were, their, they were your father or your mother. Or maybe they had the ability to stop it and they didn't. Maybe they were somebody who intentionally went after you so they could step over the top of you and get recognition or notice or the job. I don't know what it is, but there's a lot of things the enemy can bring along to throw in our water to make it bitter. But thanks be unto God. We don't have to look back to those things. The nation of Israel did not have to look back to those things because they found the healing water. They found the healer that was able to take the cross and lay it over the top of that bitter water and make it sweet that we can live and move forward in life.